Um, just a couple plots of insertion loss. You can see the insertion loss of a tap has a slight linear down tilt. It doesn't have a cable slope associated with it. So um, when taps are cascaded together, your response coming in and a cable has more of that uh, non-linear kind of arc over here, but the uh, taps typically have more of a linear response. This is the RF plot of the S21 for a tap loss going into tap on a 23 value tap. You can see it's about 23 dB of loss going through the tap. Out to tap isolation. Here's a pot for the isolation. So you can see the isolation on this tap is about 30 dB or better. That means anything coming out on the upstream is attenuated by 30 dB before it gets into the ports. Now, th that plot looks a little different for folks that aren't familiar with, you know, how isolation is plotted using the, the S parameters. <clears throat> it's not really linear. It doesn't have a cable shape. It, it has very different shape based on frequency. Is what, Why is that, Neil? Is it because of the electronics in the tap um, and the, the, the materials that are used for the directional couplers and the splitters? Or wh why is that shape so different? Yeah, so insertion loss, um, you can design the ferrites and the couplers to have very... Uh, straight linear response and frequency band. But the isolation is, you're measuring how well it separates the two. Um, it's an isolation path of the of the coupler. So that is not actually tuned. So anything below a 20 dB, and many of these isolation curves can have various bumps and curves down here. And that's very normal um, to have these types of curves that are associated with it. That's all part of the, of the Componentry of the ferrets inside the of the device that creates the splitter. So ferrets are part of the building blocks of a splitter and directional coupler, and these are natural uh, shapes for isolation on a ferret. Thank you for that. And this is the isolation from tap to tap, tap to tap isolation. So you want something lower, uh, a higher. Well, I mentioned before all these numbers are positive numbers, but this is when you're measuring on an analyzer, it's a negative number. So you do want more loss associated. So a higher number here um, in this direction has a better uh, isolation. So when you're using a particular tap and you wanted to know information about that tap's behavior, um, would you are all of these uh, figures and, and values um part of the specification sheet or the spec sheet for your devices yes these are all part of the parameters in the specification sheet um, for isolation it gives the um a spec line so everything needs to be below a certain uh d db value uh for all the isolation so insertion loss needs to be less than this a certain number so each spec has a max and min number so there's a spec line and it's spec lines not drawn on this but it has to be above or below and depending on what the parameter is so if i wanted to know what the the parameters were for the taps that were used in my market i could go to that vendors downloads section and download the spec sheet for the taps that that are in my system to understand insertion loss tap loss isolation um, out to tap, tap port to port isolation. Correct. Input return loss is actually measuring the match. Um, what we mentioned in the return loss section, how well this is matched to 75 ohms impedance. So anything below 20 dB in this line shown here has close to a 99 dB 99% transmit goes through the device, 1% uh, being reflected. So you do want a low, a high insertion loss number, a return loss number for input, output, and tap port return loss. And again, these are all nonlinear, so there's going to be slightly yes. different performance depending on frequency. Um, but I think the important part is when we're talking about input return loss. 
um, you know, at higher frequencies, we see, you know, really good above, you know, 800 megahertz up to a gigahertz or higher. And on the return side that we have really good performance, you know, below 200, um, where the upstream transmit would be coming back into the tap. So slightly different shapes, but yeah, both very good. Yes. So why do we have different tap values? So, you know, the goal for a system design is to have the same signal level to each home or subscriber in the network, uh, regardless of the distance from the amper node. So that's typical goal of the actual network. But the problem is RF signals are attenuated as they travel down the coax. Um, I showed this slide previously where the attenuation of hardline coax is a function of frequency. As you can see, higher frequencies have more attenuation than lower frequencies. And if you have a length of coax, um, if you're very measuring a very short length of coax, let's say five feet, there's very little attenuation. But as the length of the coax gets longer, 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, you'll see a more pronounced uh, cable slope associated with this because of the coax. Now, this slope here um, is one of the reasons why there's more attenuation um, as it goes down the coax, is one of the reasons, back to the goal, um, taps have different dB loss values to keep the RF signals consistent at each home. So to illustrate that a little more, and for the purpose of this discussion, you know, we'll assume flat losses on the coax just to understand why there's different um, dB loss, dB tap values. If you have an amp with an output level of plus 40 dBmV, and the goal is to have plus 12 dBmV at each home. So for example, at the beginning of the first tap, let's say you have 40 dBmV out of the amp, you go through a length of hardline cable at the beginning of the tap, instance of this tap at the input port, you have about 35 dBmV, 5 dB loss through cable. If you're looking for 12 dBmV at the home, you would select a 23 value tap so you to get 12 dBmV at the home. Um, simple addition to, to create the, um, decide which tap in the design for a 23 tap. As it goes through, the tap, if the signal level here is at about 32, after the insertion loss of this tap and the length of coax here, if it's a 32 dBmV here at the entrance of tap number two, and if you're looking for 12 dBmV, 32 minus 12, I'm looking for a loss here of about 20 dB. So you select a 20 dB tap. So you can see why as the coax length and the cascade each value of tap is a little different because you want a different loss to get the consistent 12 dBmV at each home. And that's the reason why there's various tap values in each series for a tap. So when we think about the history of designs, these, these all really play together. The output right. amplitude of your amplifiers the size of cable that you're using, because mm -hmm. the, the larger the cable, the less attenuation there is. Um, the distance between your, your passive devices, we, we see a, a broad range of, of geographies, right? Whether you're in cities where the poles are close together and the homes are closer together versus out in the country where the poles are farther apart and you know the homes are, are not as dense. You know, all of those different things are considerations for your amplifier output levels, your tap values in order to attain that consistency of, of level, uh, in which cases is, is often equated with signal quality, um, but the ability to support multiple splitters then even inside of the home. So passives are critically important to cable operators being able to, to provide consistent high level signals to their customers. We haven't even thrown the, the line passives in here yet with the directional couplers and splitters, um, but the, the, the tap description uh, here is, is spot on, Neil. I appreciate it very much.
Good. And I think it shows a very, in one quick snapshot, um, how the signal level changes down the cascade and why there's different tap values. So um, a very good illustration for that. So no matter where you are in the network, you have the same um, signal level going to each home. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about tap conditioning filters in this last segment here. Um, conditioning in the tap, there's a block diagram for that we'll show. Um, the different types of conditioners that are typically used in a network and the applications of each of those plug-in conditioners that go into a tap. I've shown this block diagram before uh, slightly. This is standard multi-tap. And what is a plug-in conditioner? It's a simple plug-in conditioner filter that goes into the tap between the directional coupler and the splitters. It's after the directional coupler. So um, the conditioning, because it's after the directional coupler, has no impact on the insertion loss going from in to out of the tap. That is the most important in the cascade. So whatever conditioner I put here and I plug that in uh, does not affect your through insertion loss. It only conditions tap ports, the F ports on the tap. And once you plug in this one plug-in here, and we'll go into the different plugins and what they do, uh, they affect all the tap ports in that tap. You cannot condition each individual port uh, on this uh, block diagram of taps. Important to note. Yes. So why do you um, condition taps? So here's a cascade taps of taps. And as RF travels down the coax, the effect of the cable slope is different at various points in the cascade. So here I'm putting you know, frequency on the x-axis and y-axis is the you know, response. So you do have an, an up tilt at the output of the node. So typical nodes or amplifiers have a slight up tilt because as this signal travels down the coax and I'm putting a linear line here as for simplicity, uh, you could see this tilt kind of go down as it travels down the coax. Um, depending on where and the length of coax, uh, it can be calculated in the design, in the drawings, what this slope will be. So each tap will have a different frequency response at the input of that tap. That now, said, going back to the, the line equalizer discussion that we had in the past uh, mm -hmm. or earlier, Historically, this is where the cable operators, not having had conditioned taps at their disposal 20, 30 years ago, would put a line equalizer somewhere out, you know, between like the third and the fourth tap in this diagram to right. add that tilt back into the downstream and then potentially condition or attenuate the upstream if upstream was active. Um, so that would have been a pretty common scenario years and years ago before condition taps was to drop a line equalizer out there toward the end. Exactly. 